Okay, welcome everyone to the May community call. Um, not April, as we may have misled you to believe. Um, so today we're we're going to jump in um, to kind of what what's coming down uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, as always, please make sure that you're um, you know if you have questions or you want to make a comment or something, you're always welcome to do that. Um, there is a webinars channel, so um, if you have a, any thoughts or questions, you can always uh, jot those down in the Slack channel, um, but you're also welcome to, to raise your hand and um, participate during these meetings. Um, and actually, we don't have any uh, announcements today, right, Charles? We're skipping announcements today? Okay, because um, we have two great talks today, so we're going to go straight into the talks. Um, so the first one is going to be about our NISA program, um, and that's going to be presented by our nurse staff member, Neil Mehta. Um, so he's going to tell us about um, the accelerating science using NISA pathfinding. Um, and then our second talk today is going to be from our early career award winner um, from uh, Kyle Bushwick, who is actually a postdoc uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is where NERSC is also located, which is great. Um, and Kyle is going to tell us about phonon-assisted Auger-Meitner recombination from first principles. Um, so let's go ahead with our first talk uh, from Neil. And I don't have your slides. There's, there's, there's a bit of a correction um, in the chat. Oh, um, words Livermore. Okay. Livermore. Okay. Yeah, whatever. It's all the same. No, joking, joking. Yeah, yeah of course. We will no. correct that for you now. <laughs> so our apologies. Yeah, my bad. No uh, worries at all. I mean, the thing with nurse still stands. We once upon a time were at Livermore. That's so. true. Right. So my comment was actually yes. still 50% correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Neil. Um, okay, so you're going to go ahead and share your screen, Neil? Okay. Yes. Oh, I can't. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's probably because I'm sharing. Uh, one second. Oh boy. Uh, okay. All right. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Okay. So first of all, let me uh, begin my talk by saying that uh, this is a work in collaboration with a lot of people moving around, uh, and not just the folks who are listed on the on the on the slide here. Um, so, with that, let me begin by describing what are the goals of the NISAP uh, workflow pathfinding uh, call and how it relates to the overall uh, future plans uh, at NERSC. So. As you all might be aware, uh, people who use uh, NERSC pretty much day in, day out um, are using Perlmutter, but the way a high performance computing center really works is that as soon as we have a machine, we already start planning for the next one and what are our user needs and how we can take that into account. And so the idea here is that the the workflows, the, the the type of work that we are seeing on on uh, on on these machines appear to be changing, and they are changing um, rapidly through user input. Um, the idea here is that simulations are not just uh, by themselves at this point. There's a lot of data involved. There's a lot of communication with the experimental facilities involved over here, um, as you can see in the in the in the image that's shown in the bottom right of the screen, nowadays, the type of workloads that we are seeing at our center is that you run an experiment somewhere, you get that data to a simulation and modeling center. Uh, for example, in our case is Perlmutter, there you run some simulations, you wanna optimize those simulations using AI or uh, any uh, AI in the loop style of um, gen uh, style of analysis, and then, the result of that analysis goes back to the experiment, which which then in, informs the experiment to run a little better. And, and this is a cyclical loop. And we want to ensure that in this loop, we provide the smoothest experience to our users moving forward. And with this goal in mind, 
Um, we are also designing the next uh, supercomputer at NERSC, but before any decision has to be made, we, we need to understand how well we can support our users in, in this typical scenario. With this goal in mind, what we found was that there's a growing role of experimental data and DOE uh, Asker is in cognizance of this fact is pushing um, integrated research infrastructure. Uh, to become a part of this integrated research infrastructure, there are several things that we need to work on our side as well as we need to work with our users to ensure that they are able to run their simulation on uh, and get data from multiple different DOE facilities and not just uh, rely on, on the archaic modes that they have been using so far. Uh, the idea here is that you would be able to ensure a more seamless, almost cloud-like uh, experience uh, in, in the coming, uh, in the next NERS system. So with, with this in mind, we want to first define what, what what are the types of HPC workloads that we we will encounter moving moving forward, and so we have broken down these high performance computing um, workloads into three distinct categories, and that would be the high performance simulation or modeling type, which which we are pretty much aware and which many of our users are currently uh, using. The next category um, is also pretty popular. Uh, which is the AI workflows. And the last one is data analytics. Now, this is a super specific uh, subset of workflows that we are seeing from big teams who generate data either uh, in their experimental facilities like uh, light source or get uh, molecular data from uh, Genome Institute. And then they would like to process this data. And so the idea uh, here is that we, although we have experience in dealing with this, now these workflows are sort of intermingling. So now you 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 are starting to see uh, high performance computing codes which which are really targeted towards GPU would want to involve some aspect of machine learning in in the in their current uh, pipeline. And this is where uh, the complexity of the workflow starts uh, increasing. Um, and as we said, we would want to ensure that all, we are in synergy with all the growing needs of, of our uh, future um, users. So with this, these are the six different categories of workflow archetypes that we anticipate um, seeing in the in the coming years. The, the first three are uh, the first two are sort of primarily what we have we have noticed uh, up until now. And so we have a high performance simulations and modeling. This is a classic type of workflow. If you if you were to imagine high performance computing, this is the most typical thing that you would think of. The next one is AI with a growing role of AI. Uh, we have multiple uh, examples of science codes that, that have already started integrating AI. Uh, the third one is cross facility workflows. And these have also been supported uh, in, in in various different levels of support at Perlmutter. Um, key, uh, chief amongst them is the LCLS project, uh, the Dune project, the, uh, the CMS uh, facility, um, and, the, uh, and the work that we do with the um, N NCM uh, and Molecular Foundry. Um, there are also examples in, in, in this particular archetype of our work with, uh, with uh, the D3D facility, which is, uh, which is the fusion uh, facility. So all these examples that you see in cross-facility workflows uh, are not necessarily, but typically large teams which which rely on uh, instantaneous uh, data being transferred to Perlmutter, then getting the analysis run instantaneously and get the results uh, being sent to them um, as fast as possible. Because these experiments which are designed are, are, are on bot time. So they you, you cannot delay the results uh, there. The, the next three categories are what we anticipate is what the next uh, half a decade or so would look like for us. And that would be a hybrid high performance um, AI uh, data transfer codes where you have a mix of everything sort of thrown in together uh, typical examples of this we have already started uh, noticing, and that would be um, something like 
uh, molecular uh, molecular dynamics codes like DPMD, where you have LAMPS, which is a which is a prototype molecular dynamics code, uh, prototypical molecular dynamics code being run, and it's extremely popular. But now you have the potential being generated on the fly uh, using an AI uh, feature. And these are the type of um, experiments that uh, simulations that we are sort of uh, beginning to get our, get our head around in, in, in terms of support. Uh, the reason why I say this is because while HPC focuses heavily on uh, compute throughput, where you would want a lot of information being processed uh, very quickly, AI typically involves data heavy uh, pipelines, which means that you would want to ingest a lot of data first before processing them. And so this is where the two worlds collide and we are trying to uh, understand and optimize uh, these sort of scenarios moving forward. And that's one of the goals of uh, the NISAP uh, pathfinding project uh, to understand how to optimize uh, these sort of uh, workflow scenarios. The next one is scientific data lifecycle workflow. Um, these are the uh, these are the modern sort of workflow that new users are beginning to sort of grasp, meaning that no longer are the users just using terminal to SSH into Perlmutter. They are uh, using more unique type of interaction with the supercomputer in the in, in the form of Jupyter Notebook. Um, they are using VS Code, uh, and and these users uh, they come from of science heavy background and not necessarily a, com a, a computational domain uh, sort of expertise. Um, the workflow here, uh, if you could imagine, would look like um, a, a genome institute researcher sort of running their uh, Vittel, Vittles uh, using Cromwell uh, on a Jupyter notebook. Now, uh, if the words sound very foreign, it's because they are, and uh, this is something that that is one of our objectives is to understand different science community um, use cases on how they typically use high performance computing and not just come up with a single one size fits all template uh, for everyone. Uh, and the last category, um, is the event-driven, um, API-driven workflow. And th that would mean that, let's say, uh, for example, CERN is running an experiment and these experiments are planned way months in advance. Uh, and th they generate a lot of data which has a lot of noise and they want to ensure that they, the through their experiment, they found what they were looking for. In such a scenario, the data has to be transferred to Perlmutter and then Perlmutter, at, at that point, ideally we would want to analyze this data almost immediately and then send it back. There, there cannot be a wait time uh, in, in these time sensitive science uh, scenarios. And so encapsulating all these six different types of workflow archetypes, uh, we put out a call um, early uh, last year, uh, late last year to solicit uh, proposals um, and to find teams which typically fit within uh, these six categories and so that we can get a good representation across the board uh, and understand how these science teams operate and what, where we can uh, improve uh, as, uh, as NERSC facility uh, in providing uh, either our expertise, uh, sharpening uh, our areas where we are not typically strong uh, and also making sure that these science teams uh, are well supported uh, on the current machine as well as next. So you may or may not have heard of uh, NISAP for Perlmutter. Uh, this was uh, this was a program that began uh, roughly late 2017 and ran all the way across 2022. The goal here uh, was basically take codes which typically were not supported, uh, were not running on GPU architecture. Uh, this was one of the keystone targets of NISAP for Perlmutter, where you take popular science codes, user codes, and help them. Um, make the jump from CPU to GPU. Uh, in this uh, evolution, as as we found more um, uh, how our users use HPC, we we also launched programs um, which which were there for data intensive and machine learning uh, purposes. Um, moving forward, though, since there is a synergy between all three different uh, categories of high performance computing, uh, we are now re-christianing this uh, so as to say into a workflow performance sort of uh, thing where 
now our support is going to be more holistic. It's, it's not going to target one feature, uh, although that's also a goal, but we are going to look at the entire pipeline of how science uh, community typically uses high performance computing. Um, so this is not to say that we are not going to continue uh, helping new users jump from CPU to GPU because that is our core uh, message uh, even today. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also going to measure how an end-to-end -end workflow looks like, how, how can we categorize and how can we define uh, the efficiency of this end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, and also we are pathfinding, uh, as you can um, Imagine from the name of the uh, of the program itself, uh, where we are looking at containerization, uh, quality of service in both uh, network and storage, uh, and also ensuring how uh, the, the science users can make use of multi-site facilities uh, that will be enabled uh, moving forward using integrated research infrastructure. And um, in addition to extending current capability, as I said, we also want to make our software modular uh, so that the workflow is not uh, primarily dependent on what software is available only on uh, Perlmutter uh, at a given time. Uh, we want our users to be empowered uh, by whatever software requirements they have. Uh, and, and in this effort, we are pushing heavily in containerization so that the support uh, as well as um, uh, the return time on installing and uh, making sure that each software is as user as user requires it uh, is taken care of. Uh, the way we selected these projects uh, was through uh, how they how clearly they uh, the teams defined uh, the technical approach and whether the scope of the work and the resources committed to the project can now be leveraged to a wider community. And so. NISAP, although the primary goal is to help science teams, uh, and we select individual teams for this purpose, but the overall uh, overarching theme here is that whatever is our finding from one science team uh, has to be applied to a wider community and has to be a productive engagement uh, between the science teams and uh, NERSC in general. Uh, and so I'll just run you through the 33 odd teams which currently form part of the NISAP pathfinding project. This is a one year project. And as you can see, they come from come in all shapes, sizes and forms from all different DOE office facilities. Uh, and they not only come from uh, other LBNL uh, divisions, departments, but also uh, from different DOE labs as well as industry uh, and academic institution. Um, the areas, uh, the science domain in which we have selected these teams uh, have to be representative of the wider science community out there, and we have ensured this. Um, and the 33 teams over here all represent different um, different types of science that's being done and different types of science that's being targeted uh, in future. For example, uh, we have a, a, a NISAP team, uh, Penny, uh, Penny Lane, which, which is from the, from the quantum computing uh, side of things and uh, from an institution which is called Xanadu. Um, they, are, they are targeting our, uh, the NISAP call to simulate how quantum computing could be used for general purpose um, uh, science problems uh, using GPU-based simulation of a quantum uh, machine. Now, this is a very uh, forward-looking project, uh, but there are also more measured projects uh, like DFDM, uh, where we are helping uh, the DFDM team with uh, implementing an acoustic wave solver. This is, this is sort of our bread and butter and making sure that uh, the wave solver, which is used for uh, measuring earthquakes, um, is properly accelerated um, uh, to do more science uh, for the wider community. Uh, there was an earlier refresh for the machine learning projects, and these are the machine learning teams uh, which, which currently form part of the uh, NISAP pathfinding call. Uh, the, we also are uh, engaging with the community, wider community, as you can see, uh, and we are not just limited to a particular uh, set of science teams. Um, we want to reach out to uh, a wider community, invite them for hackathons, and also listen to their problems uh, through uh, an email uh, chain moving forward. Um, one of the key sort of features in, the, in, this, in this particular NISAP call was to 
was to see how IRI can be made a real thing. And uh, we are working with different um, offices of um, different programs in the Office of Sci uh, Science for DOE uh, into categorizing each of the project, excuse me, each of the projects that we have selected under the NISAP call. And so breaking them down into different categories, as you can see. Uh, and these will help us understand when the IRI uh, program actually rolls around for, for the next you know, system, how exactly are uh, are we um, supporting and how optimized we are in our support uh, for, for uh, the IRI teams uh, of the future. Uh, with that, I'd like to end my talk. Uh, thank you and I'd welcome any questions uh, you may have on this. Thank you, Neil. That was really great. That was a good overview. Um, I was actually a NISAP postdoc when I first started at NURSE, but it has changed even since I, I was a postdoc. So 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 was I. So we yeah. I think many of and, us and uh, Nick and and Madame and yeah, so a bunch of us. Great. Any questions? Yeah, I have a more general question. Hi, this is Koichi from PNL. So I never uh, get involved in NISA. And so I got good overview from Neil's talk. So thank you for those you know, materials. But uh, in general, so when a uh, scientist got selected as, as one of the NISA projects, then how it goes, like what's the key difference between, you know, so we got, we want to improve our code. So let's write a ticket. And every time I got stuck, or ask questions through the ticket to support this. Compared to that, what's the really key difference of you know working as a NISAP project? So, um, uh, hi Koichi. Um, uh, good good morning. So, my question to you is: What code yes. are you working with? For example, what what is your what does your science look like? Mainly the climate. So these are running climate models, which mm -hmm. I already see some list in there. And mm -hmm. also these days, high volume, big data, how I can efficiently and easily analyze those data, particularly extract, for example, some, some kind of statistical information. Mm -hmm. Or more. I don't do really machine learning stuff myself. My colleagues are doing, and I don't think my colleagues are using GPU yet. But for me, yeah, uh, more more or less, uh, it's it's complex because I'm a model user mainly. My task for the project is using running the model. They don't pay me if I want to develop further, for example. Mm -hmm. So, so for me, I, I don't have any opportunity to really apply for this no, yet, I guess. I, I, I understand. Um, so one example that I can give you is uh, is of E3SM. Are you aware of the E3SM <laughs> team? So E3SM team uh, is one of our NISA projects. And the way uh, we, select, uh, we selected E3SM was to look at their future goals. So E3SM is a big package at this point. They, they have roughly hundreds of users. Um, and the way and and the way we want to leverage our expertise here is typically there's a big team uh, who who are looking for future goals. Uh, we find uh, an appropriate postdoc who who mm. wants to work with that team, uh, oh. and so so we connect them together so that the postdoc also gains some experience. Uh, the postdoc typically has knowledge of the domain side of things. They they also typically have information about the science side of things and then we sort of bring them together um let the science teams tell their concerns to us how they want to improve the code uh, and then uh, we sort of uh, help uh, them out um the uh, idea here the idea here is that one change to e3sm will benefit hundreds of users now that's that's not to say that we don't want to use individual users we do it's just that the given the uh, constraint that we have on uh, human resource, um, if an if there's an individual project uh, that would be better served through uh, a, a ticket, uh, which is more targeted, uh, but a big project uh, would be better served having a dedicated personnel uh, attached to that project. 
Oh, then I can ask one follow-up question. About, actually, we have a specific actually, Oichi, example. Sorry, we, Oichi, we, oh, have to go? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Just because we have our second talk. Um, but can I I really appreciate the, the discussion. Um, if, Neil, are you able to follow up with Koichi individually? Yeah, absolutely. Just just send, yeah. send me an email of some sort. Um, uh, or you can... Um, if you're part of the uh, nurse user group, just send me any uh, send me a Slack message as well. That that works for me. But email is quicker, so yeah, please okay. send me an email. I will. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I want to make sure Kyle has time for his talk today. Um, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, great. Well, yeah. NSEP is a wonderful program. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. So let's move into our um, our invited uh, early career winner talk from Kyle Bushwick, who is a postdoc in the quantum simulation group at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, so uh, yeah, just told you about um, Kyle, his, his uh, interests are uh, around the application and development of computational methods to improve our understanding of materials at an atomic level. Um, and actually maybe I'll let um, Kyle, if you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I think I saw some great pictures of, of uh, I, I actually have the same exact hummingbird feeder. So. Um, Audrey, feel like I know Kyle quite well. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let you uh, take it away. Please feel free to tell us more about yourself. And I just want you to have time for your talk. Thanks for Sounds being here. Sounds good. Let me share my screen here. Uh, let's see. Can you see the slides? Yes, perfect. Excellent. OK, yeah. So some of those photos, uh, actually, the, the one on the left was just from this past weekend. I was able to to go down to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. Uh, so I've definitely been taking advantage of uh, all of the, the great outdoor resources here uh, in California since moving uh, earlier, I guess, late last year. Uh, so I just moved out in August uh, from Michigan. And then uh, those other uh, Photos, yeah, the one, the bird feeder, we have both squirrels and hummingbirds, sometimes songbirds as well. Uh, but the squirrels are definitely the ones we feed the most, uh, but love to see them uh, at the house. And then uh, also getting to, to go to a Bay FC game uh, recently. So excited to have uh, different sports and other events to, to go to around the Bay Area. So definitely been enjoying the uh, all the opportunities uh, to have here. So I'll just kind of get into the talk now and start with a little bit more background uh, just from kind of the direction I'm coming from. So I, I did my uh, bachelor's in material science at Northwestern, and this is really where I got uh, my ex first exposure to uh, both high performance computing, but also computational material science. So I was doing research uh, with Professor Chris Wolverton. We we're running VASP calculations for the OQMD. So this is a system sort of like materials project, I would say on a, a little bit of a lower scale or smaller scale. Uh, but this really kind of uh, whetted my appetite for this type of work. And so I ended up uh, pursuing a PhD at the University of Michigan and still staying in that kind of computational materials science realm uh, using a number of other uh, open source codes. So things like Quantum Espresso, EPW, uh, which is uh, another DOE supported code, Berkeley GW, obviously, which is uh, primarily coming out of uh, Berkeley Lab. And then uh, what will be the kind of focus of my current talk is some work that I did in both developing and using uh, an in-house code for OJ minor recombination calculations. Uh, so we'll get into to more details there. And then just to finish up the, the narrative, I've now uh, transitioned to doing a, a postdoc at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And so still, still staying within the uh, computational material science realm, uh, but now shifting a little bit up from the like electronic structure, atomistic simulations to more molecular dynamics, interatomic potentials. Uh, so still kind of staying in that same realm, but uh, broadening the horizons. Uh, so before I get into the technical details, I do want to, to take a brief note on naming. If any of you have uh, kind of physics or material science backgrounds, you've perhaps heard of uh, Auger recombination or uh, the Auger effect. And there's actually been a proposal within the community to rename this as the uh, Auger-Meitner effect or Auger-Meitner recombination to recognize the contributions of Dr. Lisa Meitner, who is an uh, amazing physicist in her own right and actually independently discovered the effect a year before Dr. Pierre Auger. And so uh, given the often overlooked contributions of female scientists, we wholeheartedly support this proposal and I'll refer to uh, this process as Auger-Meitner throughout uh, my work. But what is it and why do we care about it? Uh, these are uh, some of the, the big questions. And so uh, 
a J mitin recombination can be understood as one of the recombination processes that occur in semiconductors. And so other types of processes are Shockley Reed Hall or defect recombination. This is uh, typically a one carrier uh, process or radiative recombination. This is how semiconductors uh, emit light. So that's how LEDs work. Uh, and then at three carriers, you have Auger mitin recombination. And in uh, the next few slides, I'll get into a little bit more of the details of the mechanism. But for now, we can understand it as just a loss mechanism. So uh, if your carriers are undergoing Auger mitin recombination, they're not getting used for the processes that you want them to in your device. So if we think about solar cell applications, typically want to split electrons and holes. They go through your circuit and produce electricity. And so uh, if you have Auger mitin recombination happening, then some of those uh, particles are not getting to be used for generating electricity and instead are going to be lost as either heat or they'll perhaps leak out of your kind of active region of your device. And so there was some work about two decades ago that showed, in this case, this is a, for a silicon solar cell, that the maximum efficiency that's possible in solar cells is actually limited by uh, Auger mitin recombination. And so if you can uh, perhaps lower the Auger mitin recombination rate, then you can lead uh, and improve your efficiency of solar cells. And so uh, perhaps many people have seen this plot in the upper right. It's from NREL. Um, but it's showing effectively just the, the increase in efficiency of uh, solar cells over time. And so we've had this great, uh, immense uh, improvement over time. And especially in silicon, which still dominates kind of the, the majority of the solar cell market, uh, we're kind of reaching the, the maximum uh, efficiency of these devices. And so now we can turn to uh, some of these other effects like OJ Meitner that may be uh, unlocking a couple extra percentage uh, points of efficiency, which can be uh, really big, especially when we consider the scale and scope of uh, things like photovoltaics in uh, the energy mix as we turn to more renewable energies uh, looking forward. So that's what this plot down here is showing, just that uh, solar has a huge role to play and will be kind of increasingly so going forward. It's worth mentioning uh, that of course, OJ minor recombination doesn't only affect solar cells, uh, but also plays a role in the, the efficiency of transistors, LEDs, lasers, and other semiconductor devices. Uh, but as promised, I'll go into a little bit more of the actual mechanism here. And so what I'm showing uh, in these plots is the band structure of silicon. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on, on silicon for this talk. And there's a couple of different uh, variations of OJ minor recombination that are going to be relevant that I want to introduce here. So across the board, you always have an electron and hole pair, and these are going to recombine. And then through the Coulomb interaction, so electrostatics, you're going to transfer their energy to another carrier. And that third carrier can either be another electron or another hole. And so these we call the EEH or HHE processes. So you'll see these letters uh, kind of throughout the talk, and that's just what we're referring to. Are we exciting an electron or are we exciting a hole? And these processes can happen in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is in a direct process where the energy and momentum are strictly conserved between all of these carriers. So basically, you have equal and opposite arrows here. Uh, and this is uh, energy and momentum on the, the axes here. And so uh, you have the direct process, but you also have the phonon-assisted process. And here, in addition to the energy and momentum from the carriers, you also have uh, coupling between one of your carriers and a phonon or a lattice vibration. And this uh, phonon typically has very low energy compared to its momentum. So it's uh, high momentum, low energy. And so we can think about it as almost a horizontal transition in this energy momentum space. And uh, perhaps as maybe the, the title of my talk gave way, we're uh, very interested in this, the phonon assisted process here. In terms of the actual way that we calculate uh, Auger mitin recombination rates, so this is from first principles. So the only inputs are pretty much the structure of the material. And uh, that's pretty much it. The rest is just the, the constants of the universe. So this is a very predictive type of calculation. And so we have from uh, kind of quantum formulation, this Fermi's golden rule. And we use this to describe the rates or probabilities to go from some initial state to some final state. And I know it's always uh, a little bit dangerous to put uh, equations up on slides, but I wanted to put this here just to actually break, break down the different components. And so you can uh, perhaps better understand the ingredients that go into this calculation. And so these equations are just generic. Uh, they're not actually specific for OJ mitin recombination. I'll show that on the next slide. Um, but the, the key pieces, uh, this is really where all the, the physics are for the most part. 
let's call this the, the matrix element of the perturbation. So we have some Hamiltonian, which describes the, the energy or state of our system, and it's going to be perturbed by some event. And so in the case of OJ minor uh, recombination, this could be the Coulomb interaction, which is going to be that transfer of the energy momentum uh, or the electron phonon coupling. So that's the really key component, but we also will take into account the occupation factors of the different states, uh, as well as energy conservation in this delta function. And then in the second order perturbation theory, which we need for the phonon assisted process, because this is kind of a two-step process, uh, we also have this energy denominator. Uh, this comes out from just the quantum mechanical formulation, and uh, it's not really all that important for uh, the context of understanding what's going on. So as promised, uh, I'll try to make this a little bit more concrete for the problem at hand. So in this quantum process, uh, we have two matrix elements, as I uh, said. We have the cool matrix element, which is going to be concerned with the exchange uh, of the energy that results in the second carrier going to a higher energy state when these two carriers recombine. And so that's going to happen in both the direct uh, and phonon-assisted case. In the phonon-assisted case, we also have this coupling between uh, the electrons and phonons, which is described by the electron phonon matrix element. And so these are kind of the two main ingredients that capture the physics of what's going on uh, in this problem. And so this is just kind of a restatement uh, and simplification of the equation that I had on the previous slide. So hopefully you can uh, start to wrap your head around the different ingredients that go into these calculations. Uh, a little bit more just restatement. These are the, the more formal uh, equations that we use for the direct and phonon assisted processes. But the key point I want to make here is just what are the uh, the ways that we actually get the data to do these calculations? And we're primarily using uh, GFT code quantum espresso to get our wave functions. Uh, but it also has capabilities to do uh, density functional perturbation theory calculations, which give us information about the, the phonon structure of the material, as well as the electron phonon coupling. One uh, shortcoming of DFT is that you oftentimes will underestimate the band gap and your band structure. Uh, curvatures may not be quite right, and this can be corrected using quasi-particle corrections that we obtain using the Berkeley GW code. So these are kind of the, the foundational components uh, that we, ingredients you can think of that we need to be able to uh, perform these, these full calculations that are represented uh, by these equations here. As I mentioned in the intro slide, uh, a lot of the work was on actually developing this code to be able to handle uh, these calculations. So this code was not something that I wrote entirely from scratch. Uh, it had been in development uh, for a while, but had been limited, especially in the phonon-assisted case, to uh, gamma-centered or direct band gap uh, materials. And so if you recall from the band structure uh, I showed, and actually I, maybe you can just go back there, um, in silicon, the location of your conduction band minimum and your valence band maximum uh, are not at the same point in momentum space, they're offset. And so we call this an indirect gap material. And uh, this increases the computational complexity of doing these calculations and really had been a limiting factor uh, previously. So there were no first principles codes capable of calculating the, the phonon assisted uh, AMR in indirect gap materials. And so we had to uh, add that capability to generalize the code. Uh, these calculations are, are not cheap. They do really require HPC uh, resources. And so another piece of the puzzle was actually adding in more physics to the calculations to lower the computational complexity by having uh, explicit energy conservation constraints uh, in the workflow. I do want to, to point out, uh, this is a, a NERSC talk, but this work obviously would not have been possible without the resources from NERSC, uh, but not just the computing resources, but also the support. Uh, and so one of the steps of the workflow, because this isn't just kind of a single calculation, requires running a, a number of different serial or kind of few core executables, but uh, very many of them, so hundreds to thousands of them. And so uh, kind of opening a ticket and getting support from NERSC staff uh, to best utilize those resources using a tool like New Parallel uh, was really helpful for me kind of throughout uh, this this work during my PhD. So I just wanted to to acknowledge uh, all of the help that I got from, from NERSC there. Uh, and then just to give a, a sense of the scale of these calculations, I've been saying they're expensive, they're computationally complex, um, but just to put kind of numbers on it. So these calculations are for silicon, which is perhaps one of the cheaper materials that we can uh, do. There's only two atoms in the unit cell, no heavy uh, F electrons or uh, 
kind of magnet magnetism that we need to worry about. But even still, uh, just the storage requirements for the wave functions that we need to calculate the matrix elements uh, for the direct case is over a terabyte. For the phone on assisted case is over four terabytes of data. And then we need to evaluate uh, these matrix elements on the, hundred, on the order of hundreds of millions of times. Uh, and part of the reason for this is when we think about the scaling of the system, uh, we're decomposing the electronic space uh, in meshes or K grids, uh, as we kind of traditionally call them in material science. And uh, the total number of points that we need to sample is going to scale uh, linearly with the K point sampling. Uh, but because we have this combination of different states, we actually get the super linear scaling of the total number of combinations that we need to be assessing as we go to uh, finer or uh, more dense K points, which are needed to converge the calculation. And so this is really where uh, we get killed by the combinatorics of the problem. But uh, with kind of all of these different uh, developments under our belt, we were able to, to run these calculations. And so I can actually share some of the, the results with you. And so what I'm showing here on the left are plots of uh, the carrier concentration on our x-axis and the AMR coefficients on the y-axis. And we see uh, these individual points are experimental data points. And uh, the, the colored points are the calculation results. And so we see for the EEH process, uh, our direct results actually have pretty good agreement with the experiment in the realm of uh, Auger Meitner recombination coefficients, even within an order of magnitude, is considered pretty good agreement. Uh, these are very sensitive and hard to measure. And so the error bars uh, on these experiments, and to some degree, the calculations are, uh, are not tiny. Um, but we have pretty good agreement here. But you can see uh, these are log scales on the y axis that we are orders of magnitude off on uh, for the HHE process. And this was uh, known. There had been uh, previous work using first principles calculations for the direct process in silicon. And they also found the same thing, right? Good agreement with EEH, or an n-type silicon, and orders of magnitude off with HHE. And if we look at the band structure, this makes sense, uh, right? There's available states to excite our uh, second electron to in the band structure in this direct process. So your energy and momentum can be conserved, and you still get to a valid state. But in the case of HHE, there's no states that are going to satisfy both energy and momentum conservation. And so we effectively have no AMR recombination uh, in the direct process for HHE. But you can see from the experiments, right? there's still this uh, HHE process happening. The question is just, you know, what's the actual mechanism? And so when we add in the phonon-assisted case, uh, we see indeed that it is really actually due to this electron phonon interaction. And so uh, this can be well understood because now we have that extra momentum that we can gain from emitting or absorbing a phonon. And this gets us to valid states that we can uh, have our final hole uh, get to, get excited to. And if we look at the comparison to experiments, we see uh, that we do indeed recover the kind of correct behavior. And interestingly, we also see that the phonon assisted process dominates for the most part uh, across the wide range of carrier concentrations uh, in the EEH process as well. And this is something that had been kind of uh, up for question in the literature because there had been pretty good agreement with the direct already. There was a question of, you know, how, how important are the phonons actually in the EEH case? Uh, and it turns out that they, they are indeed important. We can sum these up to get the total value. And we see, uh, again, kind of across this wide range of carrier concentrations, uh, really nice agreement. And now you might say, you know, Kyle, what about these low carrier concentrations? There's not good agreement there. Uh, and you'd be uh, very correct. Uh, but this is kind of another uh, piece of physics that we are not including in our calculations. Uh, but you have this uh, effect called Coulomb enhancement. This is a many body effect. So it's even more expensive to calculate and include. And so it's outside the scope of our current work. But there are existing models uh, to model this uh, Coulomb enhancement. And we see when we include or multiply our total results by these models for the Coulomb enhancement, we do indeed recover the correct behavior. So we're confident this is, uh, that's the, the piece of the physics that we're missing, which we, we do know uh, and recognize that that's not going to be there. Now, one of the benefits of using uh, these computational approaches, as opposed to just studying this in the lab, is that in addition to getting these total uh, contributions, we can also actually decompose uh, these contributions into along different dimensions to better understand uh, the mechanism. And so that's what I'm showing here. We can decompose uh, the total AMR coefficient, in this case, just for the phonon-assisted process, uh, along different dimensions 
of the, the phonon itself. So we can look at different phonon frequencies or energies, as well as momentums. And so we, we find that it is indeed actually these low energy phonons that are going to be the strongest contributors. You see this large peak here, both in the EEH and HHE cases, and it's primarily short wavelength uh, or large Q uh, wave vector phonons. Um, and so these plots are helpful, but it can be perhaps even more intuitive to look at them in 3D. Uh, so the plots I'm showing here are uh, the Brillouin zone. So this is effectively just, you can think of it as the momentum space uh, of the crystal. And so we see the distribution of the momentum vector for the phonon in 3D space. And so uh, for one, this just generates really nice looking plots, uh, but it can also be a little bit more intuitive. So especially when we look at the HHE process, you see that there's this core in the center. And this basically represents, you know, you need a large enough phonon wave vector to get to uh, available states to, to scatter to uh, for that high energy hole. So this gives us a little bit more kind of intuition and understanding of the mechanism uh, going on. But in addition to just doing this characterization, we can also look at potentially what are knobs available to us to, to tune the AMR coefficient, right? Once we understand it, can we do anything to engineer around it and perhaps improve our electronic devices? And so uh, one of the, the avenues that we took to, to kind of ask this question is by applying strain to the system. And so in the case of silicon, uh, what I'm showing here on the top is the, the distribution of the conduction band valleys. And so like I said, this is an indirect gap material. The conduction band isn't at gamma point, but it's actually distributed uh, along this gamma to x direction. The faces here are the x points. And so uh, typically you have six-fold value degeneracy. Uh, this is a function of the symmetry of the crystal. But when you apply strain, you change the relative energies of those uh, valleys. And so you'll selectively occupy either in-plane or out-of-plane uh, valleys. And so in this case, I'm applying biaxial strain. So if you can think about like an XYZ coordinate system, we're applying it in the XY uh, directions, and then the Z direction is going to either relax or expand, depending on if we're applying compressive or tensile strain. Likewise, with the valence bands, which is where uh, our holes are, typically you have effectively threefold band degeneracy. When you apply strain, you break that degeneracy and either have one or two uh, higher energy bands. So you'll have kind of selective occupation, and this perhaps is uh, a viable knob that we can use to tune the AMR coefficients. Now, part of the reason we thought about this was when we looked at the EEH uh, AMR coefficients, we saw that the total AMR was dominated by what we're calling this F-type uh, initial configuration, where the two electrons that are low energy were occupying perpendicular valleys to each other. And so we figured, you know, if we apply strain and really prevent this uh, occupation from happening, maybe we can eliminate this F-type uh, process or configuration and thereby decrease the overall AMR coefficient. So we were able to test this hypothesis. And unfortunately, we found uh, that we didn't decrease it, but actually increased it. And so this uh, mechanism is a little bit more complex than just only the occupations. And as you apply strain, you're also changing uh, the matrix elements that are defining uh, these interactions. And so while you are decreasing the occupation, you're also increasing uh, the concentration in other valleys, as well as modifying the matrix element. And so as these uh, values are changing, we actually, in the EEH case, increase both the, uh, in the compressive and tensile cases, we increase the overall AMR coefficients. So you do see that indeed in the tensile case, when we effectively eliminate the existence of this F-type intervalley uh, process, we do eliminate that, but unfortunately the others uh, just grow disproportionately and you're going to see this increase in the AMR coefficient. But it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we did also look at the HHT process. And so I don't have the same uh, distribution of plots here because there's not this valley degeneracy for the holes. They're just at the gamma point. But we do see that in the tensile case, we do decrease the total AMR coefficient uh, for HHT uh, photon-assisted because the direct process doesn't really happen uh, by about 40%. So this is an exciting finding that there are perhaps uh, different avenues that we could take to decrease the overall uh, AMR coefficient in specific types of devices. And so in particular, if you have a device that is going to be P-type dope, so you have uh, kind of an excess of holes, but you care about your minority carrier lifetimes, so you care about how long that electrons can exist in that region, uh, then perhaps 
applying tensile biaxial strain uh, to the system in silicon will decrease uh, your AMR coefficient and perhaps increase the, the efficiency of your device. So with that, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, I'll wrap up here. Uh, in conclusion, we developed the capability to systematically compute both direct and, very importantly, the phonon-assisted OJ-Mite recombination rates in semiconductors uh, generically. And I've shown results here that uh, our application of these ca capabilities to uh, silicon, which is one of the more important semiconductors for technological applications, we showed excellent agreement with experiment. And we also were able to then use our capabilities to investigate the role of strain in modulating these AMR uh, rates. Of course, uh, this work would not be possible without the support from the funding uh, sources. And so the, both the Office of Science uh, from the DOE and their Computational Material Science Program, as well as the CSGF uh, Fellowship, which supported uh, me during my PhD. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, NERSC for providing the computational resources that made this work possible. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great. I actually feel like I understood parts of your talk, which is really helpful. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm, I'm a physicist, and I still sometimes I'm like, I don't understand what's happening here. Um, did you, does anyone have questions? Because I do have a, a quick question, maybe while we wait, if anyone else wants to raise their hand. Um, I am curious that this strain that you're talking about applying, is that something that you have to apply continuously to the crystal for it to have that behavior? Or is it just a one-off, like you apply it and then it's changed? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, in our kind of unstrained case, we're just looking at a bulk crystal. So in this calculations, we uh, just have the, the crystal and it's undeformed and it's in its kind of ground state. The strain that we're looking at, it would be kind of continuous. So you're still in a static regime where the crystal has just been strained uh, and is kind of in this permanently strained state. And this is uh, experimentally feasible because of uh, kind of epitaxial growth. And so in a lot of these semiconductor devices, you have your active region that's grown on some substrate, and that substrate is typically not the same material. And so you might have this lattice mismatch. And so you can actually tune basically that lattice mismatch will, because the atoms still want to, in the same crystal structure, kind of sit on top of each other or in this regular periodic system, but the period is slightly different from the substrate to your active material. And so you could grow uh, on these substrates with epitaxial strain. And so this is actually used in uh, a number of different applications already. So this is not necessarily like some moonshot type of application. Sure. Um, it's it's worth mentioning that unfortunately, this probably wouldn't uh, be feasible to, to use in uh, solar cells because the thickness of the silicon solar cell is pretty large. And so if you're straining it, you'll develop kind of cracks in your solar cell. Mm -hmm. um, but for thinner devices, so things like transistors, uh, it still could definitely be, be feasible. And outside of silicon, uh, a lot of solar cells that are much uh, smaller because they do have these direct gaps, so they absorb light more efficiently, those can be uh, thin films, and those you can epitaxially strain uh, without kind of producing in intense uh, strain accumulation and cracking in your system. Right, right. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, I do see there's a question from Elaine. Um, would you like to uh, unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the nice talk. Yeah. I'm Elaine from Sanadu here. Um, I'm just curious to understand. I have two questions. Like basically, I assume that you're doing DFT, GW, better, so better to get the excited states and then you compute rates using an electron phonon operator, right? Yes. Okay. I'm curious to see. I have one question. How do you uh, how do you see this methodology working uh, for strongly correlated excited states? I mean, you are, you are, you are simulating silicon, but right. what, like, for example, a transition metal, decal cogenite, or something where we know that we, we have important local correlations. And second, this is for me to learn, what's, what's the form that, of the electron phonon interaction operator you're using in your calculations? Yeah, so uh, for the first question, in terms of the strongly correlated materials, uh, we haven't really looked at that. So I don't have a, I can't answer from experience, but I would uh, think that in terms of getting the, the electronic structure, we can use kind of the typical uh, tricks that folks try and tend to try to use. So applying or using uh, Hubbard U uh, to get that separation. 
And so uh, the code that we have for calculating these AMR coefficients takes as input the uh, electronic structure and the wave functions. And so we're using quantum espresso and Berkeley GW, but you're kind of not limited to doing that. And so you'd maybe have to tweak some of the, the inputs for the code and how it's reading in that data, depending on the output from another code, but you're not limited to kind of those, those methodologies. So you could use kind of any other methodology that's more reliable for those types of systems. Um, in terms of the electron phonon uh, matrix element, we're getting it from, uh, I'm trying to think if I have, let me see if I have uh, in the backup slides. I don't think I have uh, kind of the, actually maybe here. Um, yeah, so uh, this square here is the, the electron phonon matrix element. Uh, so this is what's getting calculated within uh, the quantum espresso code package, but we're looking at the, the variation of the potential. Uh, this is the, the DV operator basically from the density functional perturbation theory. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Thanks for your questions. Okay, any other final questions for Kyle? I do have one maybe quick question. So these, the two types of, um, I can't remember what it is now, like EEH and HH, mm -hmm. are those present in all materials? Like the, like the materials you're looking at, it's not something you could say, I'm going to select for a material that's mostly HHE, and then I don't even have to worry about this EEH problem anymore. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's also a, a really good question. So uh, AMR is an intrinsic process. So it's always going to be happening in your material. You can't really just stop it. Um, but depending on the, the carrier concentrations of your materials, one of them will probably be dominant. So if you have a material that's kind of ambipolar, it's doped in an ambipolar fashion. So you have about equivalent uh, concentrations of electrons and holes, then both EEH and HHE are going to be important. But if you're in maybe the p-type region of a device, so you have much higher concentration of holes, then the HHE process is going to be dominant because you have this high concentration of holes. And so that's really going to be uh, right. the, the dominant mechanism. And likewise, if you're in the n-type region, the EEH process is going to be most important. Uh, and so that's why I was talking, when I was talking about, you know, the specific application for applying strain and lowering the AMR rate is going to be in a, a p-type region of a device because this HHE process is then going to be the dominant one. Um, but we care about the electron mobility because that's going to be what's uh, limited, basically, because you're going to be using up more of your electrons in a, a region that's typically depleted from that electron uh, concentration relative to the holes. Right. Okay. Because if you didn't, if you weren't in that sort of p-type space, these would it would kind of be a wash. In fact, it would it would actually get worse, right? Because if these right. are if these are happening in roughly the same proportion, then it would actually get much worse. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks, Kyle, for this lovely talk and for your great work. Um, congratulations again on your thank you first award. Oh, clearly well deserved. Um, and welcome to the Bay Area. I actually don't live in the Bay Area myself, but oh, okay, uh, <laughs> but still welcome to the labs in the Bay Area. And Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for joining and have a great day, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.